Hi, my name is Kirsten Robertson, and I'm with the Greenville County Soil and Water Conservation District, and um, we're here to talk about stormwater pollution. Cool. And I'm Lynn Pulaski. I'm Janine Haler, also with Greenville County Soil and Water Conservation District, and I am a community relations coordinator. Um, so I, along with Lynn, run a lot of our programming. We do a lot of our community outreach and education. Okay. Wow. Um, I just want to really quickly also, uh, I looked through your website and you have some really great information. So like for anyone interested uh, in kind of really taking a deeper dive into this topic, uh, greenvillesoilandwater.com is your website. And um, I realized there's some classes I need to take on there. Like uh, I think on like water harvesting class and all this. there's some really cool stuff you have on it. So um, anyone interested in, in uh, after this interview, uh, taking a deep dive into the website, please do so. Uh, so broadly, what we want to talk about today is uh, everyone maybe watching this has a yard, whether they're renting a house or owning a, they own a house, they have a yard and by default have to manage that yard uh, one way or the other. So they can either hire someone to do that for them, they can do it themselves. Um, but ultimately, what we're trying to promote personally, and you guys are also as an organization, is basically uh, sort of responsible land and stewardship on a, on a lot by lot basis. You know, people. Uh, there's a lot of pollution that comes off yards. And I think one of the things that really struck me um, when doing research like 10 years ago uh, is that a lot of people are aware of maybe farm pollution, you know, from fertilizer runoff to manure runoff to uh, all the different stuff that goes into that. But actually on an acre by acre basis, um, residential yards are actually a lot worse uh, than the average conventional farm. Um, and turf grass is the top irrigated crop in the United States by size. And NASA did a big analysis and said, you know, you think, you, you ask somebody, what's the biggest crop in the United States? You know, is it corn? Is it wheat? What is it? You know, it's actually turf grass. So this is a huge, you know, amount of acreage that's, um, it's devoted to yards and the way we manage those yards, I think is really critically important to, um, you know, you, you don't have to care about anything other than just your neighborhood, right. Or just, uh, the forest in the area, but the quality of the drinking water in the community you live in to see the impact of this stuff. So um, I guess that's probably what we're going to be talking about. And since you guys are experts, I'm just going to maybe go through some of the questions. And uh, you, either one of you could chime in and say, uh, and, and respond to those questions. So the first one was, uh, let's maybe just probably talk about what pollution means um, in the context of a residential yard. So um, what are the maybe some of the categories of pollution um, that we could think of? Uh, to kind of help frame this conversation. What, what does it mean? What is yard pollution in the sense of soil and water? Sure, I'll take this one. Um, so the pollutants that we, we find most often in the yard um, are the obvious ones. You'll have your fertilizers, you'll have your, um, because of course everybody wants green grass, so they're gonna fertilize their lawn. Uh, you'll have your pesticides, and also with the lawn, you're going to have your herbicides because people are wanting to get the weeds out of their lawn. Um, additionally, yard waste itself is a pollutant because that can break down and uh, the nutrients from that can go into our rivers, lakes and streams. Pet waste is one that a lot of people don't think about in their yard particularly, they may pick up after their pet when they go on a walk, but maybe they don't in their yard. Mm -hmm. Those are kind of the big ones. And then not in your yard per se, but in your driveway, used auto fluids are also a problem. Okay. Um, another one that, that, that I see, that I, I take our baby out for a walk and give, uh, give mom a little break in the morning every, every day. So when I'm walking around, I'm kind of looking at different landscape management practices and uh, there's a, spot in my neighborhood where there's a big hill and there's houses on it and the folks aren't doing a great job of sort of maintaining that area it's got trees on it but uh basically it's bare ground and so after a big rain the sidewalk and then the sort of the storm runoff you can see the soil uh you know red red, red clay Appalachian soil you know, soil running off into the uh into the drainage and obviously into the creek downhill as a result of that so that's maybe another just one other additional potential thing is you don't think about is like filling up these creeks or these rivers with silt and what that could do. So, um, anyway, but yeah, I think the other, the other categories are pretty much covered. So maybe soil runoff, pet waste, chemical runoff, uh, fossil fuels, pesticides, uh, and I guess all that ultimately contaminates somewhat the water that comes out of that yard during rains. 
Um, and then ultimately, you know, a lot of people think about where, where does the water go when it comes, or where does this pollution go when it comes out of your yard? Where does it ultimately go? Because we think, you know, sort of like trash, you throw it away, you don't think about it, but where does that ultimately end up going? What does it impact? So stormwater rains from the sky, runs across the ground, picks up everything in its way, and it goes right into rivers, lakes, and streams here in South Carolina. It may run into a storm drain, but storm drains do not go to a treatment facility. They just deliver everything that goes into them right into our waterways. Is there any possible, uh, this might be getting a little bit off the topic, but there's, there's zero filtration in, in those systems, I, I guess, by design. There's probably really no way to do, do that well, right, or affordably to filter that water on a community by community level before it goes into the nearby waterways. Really, your way of filtering the water is to make sure that the pollutants are not on the ground to start with. Mm -hmm. That that's that's the it, it's on an individual basis. Um, we run it. We have a campaign here uh, called "Clean Water Starts with Me," and it's all about individual actions that people can take to prevent those pollutants from impacting our waterways. Yeah. If um. If you had to guess, and this is probably just a why you're throwing darts here, uh, what percentage of landscapes would you say are well managed in residential landscapes? Would you say it's like one out of ten houses in Greenville, or fifty uh, percent? Is this is this something? Is there a big uphill battle for you guys, or is it something that people are really sort of saying, "Hey, this makes sense. I'm going to start doing it." I think right now that um, people just aren't aware. They don't understand that. It, that everything they do has an impact and that if they're fertilizing and they haven't tested their soil and they have this big bag of fertilizer that they just got from the big box store, that if they put out a little, that it's going to be better if they put out more. But in reality, what happens with that extra fertilizer is it runs straight into the nearest river and it can call, cause algae blooms, which can kill um can cause fish kills. So um, I think most people just aren't aware. And on top of that, they there is a certain aesthetic that people are looking for that we we need to change. We need people to see um, taller plants and more diverse yards as being beautiful instead of seeing them as jungles and something negative. Yeah. I think this is the biggest battle. Yeah, one of the campaigns that I'd really like to um, get pushed forward is rethink weeds, right? Because a lot of people, they see a dandelion. And what do they see? They see a weed. What do I see? I see beautiful flowers and possible tea. Yeah, so that food, it's good stuff. Mm -hmm. And pollinator plants. Um, so maybe let's, we can dive into some of the nut, nuts and bolts of this. Uh, so practical tips to reduce or eliminate those various pollutants. Um, uh, and, you know, I, I kind of had a list that I came up with just based on my knowledge, which is much less than yours. So can we kind of help him uh just a few kind of simple practical tips of what they could start doing uh, right now on their landscapes to make them cleaner, more biodiverse, uh, et cetera? As I mentioned before, pet waste. Pet waste is a huge issue and people don't think about picking up after their pets in their yards necessarily. So... We did um, a little bit of research on this and in Greenville County, an average dog, and this is the average of all dogs, generates 275 pounds of pet waste of poop every year. The estimate is that we have 321,664 dogs in Greenville County, which equals 88,457,600 pounds of pet waste in the county every year. Well, wow. The general public, they think, okay, well, I don't have to pick it up in my yard because it's not impacting everybody else. But the pet waste, even, even when the solids are gone, the bacteria and the um, parasites can last in your lawn up to 18 months. So really, if you're not picking it up, you may not see that pet waste anywhere, but you're going through your yard and then you're tracking that into your house. And conversely, it's also every time it rains, all of that bacteria and all of the nutrients from pet waste 
are flowing right into our waterways. So that's kind of a big overall thing that people can do that maybe they're not doing. Um, we're doing better at it. So we, we survey people every year and the percentage of folks who are picking up after their dogs increases year over year, which is great news. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's kind of a big, big picture thing, but that's not, that doesn't impact lawns. Shanine, maybe you can talk about the well, lawn. Yeah. We just I wanted um, I wanted to just say, I think the reason we all pause when you ask that question is because there's so many things that people can do that aren't really major changes in their regular maintenance of their yard specifically. So if we're going to talk about like fertilizers and pesticides or herbicides, um, especially fertilizers, test your soil. It's less than $10 through Clemson, I believe. Um, and you can go ahead and you can be more efficient with not only your money, but um, your time and efforts as well by just taking like one soil sample twice a year. Yeah, that's exactly what the, the kind of stuff I think would be really helpful for people. But even uh, without overwhelming people with information, there's a big difference between fertilizers, right? Like, so you could have synthetic nitrogen fertilizer, which is sort of like just the, uh, you know, just the lambs. It's just, uh, it goes right in. It gives those plants a quick boost and you're all happy because your grass is green. But then like 90% of it ends up, especially if you have, you know, low quality soil that ends up washing right through it versus something maybe like you know that that's a little bit more expensive up front maybe worm castings or compost where you just put a little bit of that on your grass and a lot of that is actually not immediately available nutrients it's biology which ultimately feeds those those grass roots and sort of keeps that nutrient cycling go, going clean help clean the water um so maybe even you know i, I guess from my perspective, since I grow a lot of food and since we have never used fertilizers on our yard, I'm, I think about it in the sense of we're always thinking about how can we boost the biology in the soil and then the biology does the work for you. So even mineral fertilizers or chemical fertilizers aren't necessary if the biology is present to you know, help cycle those nutrients, especially if you're not you know, dumping your uh, your lawn clippings, which is one that drives me crazy in our neighborhood. I see, uh, see our neighbors, I don't know how to break the subject with them, but I see our neighbors that you know, have whatever... Kim Green comes over and sprays her yard with a bunch of chemicals, and then they take their grass clippings and dump them out, whatever, in the, you know, kind of the vacant lot. And all that stuff is basically food for the soil. So they're, you know, sort of kind of on this perpetual cycle of uh, essentially starving their soil and then replacing what they're taking out with chemicals, which then wash into the waterway. So it's, like you said, it's one of those things where how do you educate the public um, about about this stuff without having to have like sort of PhD level conversation with you, but maybe the, the four If inches. you go your yard at four inches and then you leave those clippings on the lawn, then you get the, the roots are able to grow deeper into the soil, hold onto that soil better. And then that, it, that's an, an improvement too. So for many folks who mow their own yards, we're like mow it every second week instead of every week. And, uh, that that's an easy excuse. They can say I'm doing it for the soil. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think one of the things that I like about this is that, you know, so many things are kind of political, right? They, you know, what, no matter what it is, there's an issue you can sort of somehow divide it into uh, what, whatever political partisan uh, perspective you have on it. But in this case, I think it's just dollars and cents too. So it's like, why wouldn't you do this? If you, it, it has nothing to do with politics. If you say like, who, you know, raise your hand if you want to save money uh, and, maybe do less work in your yard. Uh, yeah, that sounds, that sounds good. I mean, it, so I, I guess what I'm saying is this isn't even necessarily an environmental stewardship thing. You don't necessarily have to care one iota about the environment, um, locally or otherwise, if you just want to, you want to save a few bucks and do a little less workout in your yard, then, then, uh, yeah, that, that seems something that should, should have widespread adoption once people, kind of, once that kind of light bulb comes down for people. Um, but I guess it's, uh, you know, the other side of that, though, is that uh, a lot of folks that I know also, and especially in kind of maybe upper neighborhoods, they have uh, lawn crews come in or lawn maintenance crews. And so they're sort of totally on auto autopilot. And those crews mm -hmm. are tasked with basically keeping the yards weed free, green, you know, sort of the golf course look. Um, and the person actually in the house has no idea what's going into that property. They just pay a check every couple of weeks or every month or whatever it happens to be. The other thing that, that we do in the, in the areas of our lawn that are uh, that are grass because we have a lot of beds and 
edible areas and whatnot, um, is that we use a, we use a, a, I used to have an electric mower, which was kind of a pain in the neck because then they had to have the cord and that was, that was aggravating. So now we have a little, just a little push mower like they used back in the day. That thing's awesome. It, it takes me way less time to mow. And I, it, it's so quiet and like there's no pollution, you know, belching off of it. There's no fumes. And I have uh, a lot of times I'm just wearing the baby while I'm doing this. So, and he, he falls asleep. Um, so I think for a lot of people too, like use a, uh, use a little real mower. Like, you know, that's, that's something that there's a little better exercise than maybe a riding lawnmower. And it, obviously it depends on the scale. If you have like a five acre lawn, like, like Kirsten does, uh, with livestock, um, that might be a, a little bit ch- more challenging, but I think for a lot of the small homes, it's perfectly or smaller yards, perfectly, uh, able to do that and never breaks down. I don't have to go out into a gas station and get fuel. I don't have to you know, plug it in. I'll just, it's, it's stu- stupid, simple. So, um, I'd be happy to have you as my neighbor, Aaron, because then I wouldn't have to hear the lawnmowers all the time. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's noise pollution, which is a totally different mm-hmm. issue. You're outside just trying to relax. And all of a sudden you, know, you hear that thing going and they're, you know, this is crazy. Yeah. Um, Let's see another one. So this is one that interests me, and this is one that I've uh, I, I probably had personally violated. So we talked about um, basically the, the the stuff from cars, like washing your car in the yard, is one of the things that you guys recommend. Um, well, first of all, I can't get our car into our yard because there's beds everywhere with plants that I have to drive through, you know, like a persimmon tree to do that. Um, and second of all, I'm using uh, when I do wash our car, which unfortunately it's only about like once a year. I'm pretty pretty bad about it. Uh, I'm using like uh, like Dr. Bronner's soap, which is biodegradable. So the soap itself it would typically be a pollutant if you're using Dawn or something like that. Um, but in this case, that's not a source of pollution. But what I probably am doing is washing pollution off the car, which is, you know, biocarbons and uh, whatever, black carbon and tar and all the other crap that comes off the roads and other cars. So, you know, unfortunately, I am washing that stuff, but that's making me rethink what should I be doing? Um, where should I watch should I take my car to a car wash? Um, yeah, that's an easy that's an easy solution, especially if you only wash once every eight months. Yeah. It's fairly inexpensive. Yeah. And we recommend taking your car to a car wash that has the commercially recycled water um, and not one. If you go to a car wash and you see the water from the suds rolling into the street, you might as well be washing it at home. It's the same uh impact on on the um, water system Um, but most well many commercial car washes recycle their water so that's that is who we recommend that you um, take your your car to and for other folks who can wash their cars on their lawn that's kind of the best uh, possible solution and that's not to say that you need to leave your car on the lawn or park it on the lawn every single day because that can lead to some compaction Um, but if you wash it on on the lawn, then what's happening is the suds and everything that's going from your car is going into the plant material and the soils, and the microbes are able to kind of eat that up and filter it before it gets into our water system. Okay. Um, and then one thing I, I'm kind of going to back up real quick, and this is directly to uh, to Kirsten um, that that, I, that I've been curious about. So, from a standpoint of animal waste, uh, obviously you can't pick up your dog's pee. It's not very easy to do. Um, but we're talking about the poop part of this equation. Um, there's a difference between, so in, in intensive management or, or sustainable or regenerative uh, ag, there's obviously a, a big push for actually using animals to build soil um, through you know proper livestock management and proper in the various things that they're doing out there, which Kirsten is also doing at home. Um, so, Animal manures can, in certain contexts, build soil and be good ultimately for the watersheds. Uh, but in the context of a residential yard, um, they could also, you know, so it's sort of how you use the animals and the application and whatnot. So maybe could you just talk really quickly about uh, why, in the context of, uh, let's say your uh, your your landscape, Pearson, um, that that animal poo, that manure is actually building the soil via the ruminants versus a, uh, let's say a big, your big mastiff, which uh, produces quite a bit of waste. Why, why would that, uh, what's the difference between those things? How's that equation, how, how's one equation kind of positive environmentally and one's maybe more negative environmentally? Sure, that's, that is a great question because we get that a lot because people always say, well, what about the wildlife? And what about, um, you know, do bears poop in the woods? And, and 
why is a dog any different than a wolf? And the the answer to that, I'll, I'll get to the ag part, but the answer to why dogs um, are more of an influence is because they actually have more bacteria in their fecal matter. So it, um, it does affect more in that they have more than wolves, they have way more than, say, ducks or geese or any of the other wildlife. But it, it is way above those levels. And then on top of that, we have so many more dogs per square acre in a suburban or an urban environment, which is what Greenville County is becoming, and a lot of places across the United States, that um, the, the number of dogs is way more than the ecology in the area can actually absorb and, and take care of. Now, if you bring it over to, if you want to talk about the ag part, if someone is actually conscientiously, regeneratively uh, working their animals, they're moving those animals so you don't get the huge areas where the manure piles up and, and causes a problem. If it is moved around the land, you're moving your animals, and so they can't make the waste pile up at a watering point or in the shade or in the barn because they're in a different place every day. And that allows that area to be able to absorb and, and use that fertilizer, which again has a lot less bacteria than your dogs do. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I'm just going to kind of quickly summarize. So the the, the, the flora, the, or I guess the gut flora in a dog is different from the wolf, and there's probably a lot more pathogen, pathogenic bacteria in that stomach uh, or in that digestive system. So when that comes out, that's an issue. And then obviously there's not, uh, whatever, 100,000 wolves in Greenville or however many dogs, I forgot the number, the big number. Um, so if that was the case, I think we'd all be staying inside, not a good old spirit. And then uh, just, the, just the sheer quantity of waste that's produced in a single you know, acre of residential property from dogs is obviously significantly higher than it would be with a, uh, a population of wild wolves, which would be, or livestock or, or deer for that matter, you know, that, that are constantly moving around and um, spreading that over a you know, broadly geographically distri distributed area. So, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Um, let's see here. Another thing, uh, you, you, uh, there's obvious stuff too, like don't dump, you know, you, I don't know who meant. Maybe somebody does this. They dump, they clean the oil or take the oil out of the car and they dump it in the lawn. I think people used to do that back in the day a lot more than they do today, thankfully. Um, or any other pollutants. Uh, another, a big one that I think personally really has helped our yard a lot uh, from a water runner standout is we have a lot of beds with a lot of mulch, wood chip mulch, um, which builds the soil. And then obviously it helps to, uh, you know, there's a big difference between when rainwater is coming down, if it splashes on bare soil. Uh, versus if it splashes on mulch or living plants or whatever, you know, it really kind of helps to break up and distribute that that rain droplet and help uh, prevent erosion in a big big way. Um, so I guess uh, what, you know, using uh, putting a lot of perennial beds in, and you guys mentioned uh, also on your website, uh, you know, perennial uh, that can be edibles, it can be you know, native plants, it can be wildflowers. There's a lot of different options there to that help on multiple levels. So you can have a you know really beautiful kind of native pollinator garden if you want to, um, with, while also, you know, reducing pollution. Um, so let's see here. Um, I guess, well, is there any other, uh, looks like you wanted to say something, Kirsten? Yeah, yeah. Let me go back to your point about that people don't just uh, throw their, their used oil or that type of thing on the ground. Actually, we, we, I follow up on quite a few complaints. People do tend to, it's not necessarily in their yard. A lot of times they throw things in the storm drains and they don't realize that those storm drains go straight to the rivers, as we were talking about earlier. They're, they're not in any way um, treated. And so there, there are so many people who think that washing out paintbrushes right beside the storm drain or dumping oil or the water from when, say, they rent a um, one of those shampooers to shampoo their upholstery or their carpet, they'll go outside and pour that straight into the storm drain. 
where a much better option would be to pour it on your lawn so that the, the grass and the soil would have a chance to absorb and, and take on some of that um, added nutrient, having it pretty straight in the door, storm drain. Thanks. But not oil. What's that? But not auto, not used oil. Right. That has that stays off entirely because your car holds enough motor oil to produce an oil slick um, eight acres on a lake with just just the oil from your car. And we have run across some folks um, who say, "Well, I pour the oil from my." oil change, I pour it on my fence post because it keeps the bugs off of it. Um, so there are way better ways of doing that than pouring used auto oil on it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's an interesting choice. Um, and, and I guess, thankfully, the recycling facilities around here, which are now back open, I think, uh, are, they do take used oil. I mean, there's, there's ways to dispose of all this stuff. So you don't have to dump it on your fence post or dump it into the storm drain. Um, mm -hmm. There's you know, you, you all make it easier. The county makes it very easy for us to dispose of that stuff at the nearest recycling facility. Um, let's see. Um, I guess any other tips that you guys could think of that we haven't uh, talked about for, for homeowners? We've kind of talked about the general, you know, landscape management as far as keeping the grass tall, using the clippings, uh, you know, the perennial beds and perennial plants, um, you know, reducing the pollution washing your car. Uh, and, and I guess one thing we just want to make sure to clarify is that you mentioned soil compact. So if you're parking your car all the time on that soil, uh, you are going to compact the soil and reduce its ability to kind of act as a filter. Uh, so what you're talking about is basically like, you know, put it out there, wash it, and move it back onto a solid surface. Um, I guess any, anything else, that, any other tips that for homeowners that, that are kind of biggies that could do? Sure. Plant natives. If you have the opportunity and you have a selection of, of plants that you could plant in your yard, plant natives, they're going to require, they're, they're suited to this environment. So they're going to require less fertilizers. They're not going to require maybe watering and turning on um, a sprinkler system on them. They're, they're adapted. So that should, we recommend planting natives always. Mm -hmm. Okay. Actually, one thing you just said that is triggered in my in my brain is that uh, watering. Um, so you see the irrigation systems come on. Uh, yeah, a lot of people are actually irrigating their 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 crop being grass uh, incorrectly as far as doing it every day and just doing like a shallow watering. Uh, I think you, you again, you guys are the experts. I think the the recommendation actually for good root systems and grass is to water maybe once a week, water deeply, and do it like early in the morning. Is that correct? What we end up finding here, because we have a lot of clay in our soil, is that when you um, when you try to water deeply, you end up the water the first water seals the the top of the soil and the rest of it just runs off. So it turns out that if you water your lawn for maybe twenty minutes quickly and then shut it off, let that infiltrate, and then do another twenty minutes, that that better than watering for an, for 40 minutes or an hour and having most of it run off. The, the key is it's not how much it rains, it's how much your soil actually absorbs. So you want to optimize that based on your soil type. Also, um, it probably goes without saying, but you should check your sprinklers every now and again to make sure that you're actually watering your lawn or your landscaping and not the street because we see that all the time. Um, and the other thing that I would say as far as watering systems go, um, make sure that you have, they have systems that have rain sensors on them because people will be watering their lawns or their landscaping in the rain, turning it off in the winter so you're not icing the street, you know, those kind of things. Yeah. Or breaking your irrigation system when it all freezes up. So. Right. Let's see here. Um, gosh, I had something else I was going to do. You triggered my brain and I forgot about it. Um, so I think that does pretty much pretty much cover it. Uh, yeah. So is is uh, what what efforts around the country? I, I guess do you guys we kind of talked about just the general effort here locally. Maybe it's kind of hard to measure, but 
is this are there any, is there any data out there nationally or statewide about kind of uh, maybe areas of the country where, where this is all kind of going pretty well as far as adoption or you know based on incentives that are maybe provided at a local level or you know tax breaks or whatever it happens to be or even kind of positive stuff where you, yeah, I noticed on your on your uh, website also you have like a sign you can I forgot what it's called like maybe um, there's a sign you can put up in your yard once you kind of go through a certification process to essentially you know show that hey I've I've done these steps and my yard is a uh, what what is it called exactly yeah Carolina yards there you go through Clemson extension okay um, which is something we probably need to get is to maybe raise some awareness with our neighbors um, but I, I guess is, is is you guys feel pretty optimistic about uh, kind of wide adoption of some of these practices uh, amongst homeowners? It's getting better and better year over year. Um, people are, they're implementing the Carolina Yard strategies. Um, one thing that we didn't talk about are buffers, water quality buffers, um, and leaving some wild area between the edge of the lake or the waterway and either your yard, your farm, whatever it is, um, those are getting implemented more, which is really fantastic. Um, yeah, we're making progress. Good. Yeah, I think in, in farming, they call those riparian buffers. I think there's even like a lot of state or federal kind of incentives to make sure that farms leaving whatever strip of forest or whatever it happens to be between the farm and the wetland. Um, so, cool. Okay. Uh, well, I think that unless uh, you have other stuff that we haven't covered that I haven't asked, um, that might that might cover it for now. Are y'all feeling good about about the messaging? Anything else you want to add for Greenville people specifically? I think just a general summary. There are resources out there, and you don't have to make big changes to make an impact on our water on our water quality, and it's everybody's responsibility. I'll plug your website one more time just for the, lo for the locals. I guess even non-locals could probably find this very beneficial. Yeah. It's greenvillesoilandwater.com. It's pretty simple. Mm -hmm. Thanks. All right. Thank you all. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Aaron. Bye. Bye.